Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jamie Fritz. Nice great crowd. Um, yeah, I got the really uh, easy job today. And I don't have to take long. I have to introduce Cornell, and it's really easy for me. Um, quite simply, every time I see or hear him, he makes me feel really good. When he's finished. Um, very quickly, because uh, very quickly I will be off. We were in a trial a few years ago out at Hancock Air Base, and my grandson was supposed to be here. He's not here now, but he was at the trial, and he was really causing a ruckus to the point he was two, and the judge said, uh, That young man doesn't quiet down, we're going to have to have him removed from the courtroom. And I went, Hey. Um, so uh, when he saw uh, the judge and everybody turn toward him, he quieted down for a minute, but 15 seconds after we started the proceedings, he started up again, and the judge had the uh, bailiff or the policeman in the courtroom had my daughter take him out of the court, and I just saw a picture of uh, like Bobby Seale and Pampers. You know, <laughs> being poked out of that courtroom, and I felt so good uh, when that happened. Um, about earlier in my life, I was uh, watching a, a news show, Meet the Press or Face the Nation or something. I was 15 or 16, probably going through the channels looking for a football game, and I saw this black uh, leader. He was being questioned uh, pretty severely and I stopped instantly. Uh, I, I took note, his demeanor seemed so different. And they would ask him, what is, what is your name? Oh, sir, your name isn't really X. And he said, they said, your name is uh, Little. He said, uh, Little was the name of a plantation uh, where my ancestors probably emanated from. And X stands for the unknown. I would, I prefer to identify myself by that from, from a really egregious known history. Um, they were throwing questions at him like, uh, do you, would you advocate violence? And these are the kind of questions that would really make our civil rights leaders very apprehensive. And he said that he would respond to anyone in the manner that he was addressed. If someone addressed him in a violent manner, that that would be, would be inclined to uh, respond the same way. And he was so dignified um, after seeing that, I really felt empowered and uh, much better about myself, uh, just observing uh, the dignity that he carried himself. That was El Hakim Miguel Shabazz from Malcolm X. Uh, later on in life, later on in life, uh, I read Beyond Vietnam by Martin Luther King. And it took me a while to get a lot older and uh, really read it. And he had such a comprehensive look at the problems that were caused in the world, the reasons they were caused, and some solutions, some ways to start healing. And after I saw the genius of uh, the way he looked at it, uh, I feel good every time I, I read that speech. Well, I was watching PBS, scrolling through, and I saw this brother right here, Dr. West. I didn't know who he was, but when he spoke, it made me go like, whoa, who is this guy? After a while, a couple months later, I, I was listening to a show with Amy Goodman, uh, Democracy Now!, and she said Cornell West was coming. Well, I live out in the trailer out in the country, but I was get my radio set and my antenna so I could make sure I wouldn't miss a word at that point. Um, and I knew I wouldn't be disappointed, just like I know you all won't be disappointed, and I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> I went to, um, and this is like kind of a weird way to tie in, but I was in a Chinese restaurant eating some shrimp fried rice, going down, and I finished it, and I got to the uh, fortune cookie cracked it open, and it said, 
People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that, to me, was the embodiment of the Beyond Vietnam speech, um, El Hajj Malik, with the knowledge that he had and the caring that he had for his people. And that's what I feel every time uh, that I hear Cornel West speak. And before I introduce him, I want to state that these proceedings here are being sold, uh, being uh, uh, held on uh, stolen island out of land. And I'm not, uh, you know, I'm from Turtle Island, which they call uh, Tompkins County, stolen from Cayuga land. And this is something we need to uh, understand and recognize before we get started. But um, back to Dr. West, it's unbelievable um, his knowledge and his caring is uh, so evident. His knowledge you can easily get watching television or um, the books he's written. And I don't have the time to go through his accomplishments, nor do you. Uh, degrees and accomplishments, awards, unbelievable. But uh, without any further ado, I feel Cornell West is a brother whose knowledge is here and his caring is above that. It's my honor and my privilege to present, to present Dr. Cornell West. Constancy. 
keeping track of every person. And when they're rendered invisible, when they're pushed to the margins, when they're pushed to the peripheral, we try to cast a spotlight on them. And you could be atheist and agnostic, you could be Buddhist, you could be Hindu like Gandhi, you could be a Jesus loving free black man like myself. No one of us in the front of the train, we all on it together. <laughs> oh yes, we all on it together. I'm going to salute all of you all up here in Syracuse and various parts of the other parts of New, of New York, upstate New York. Something is happening in Syracuse and something is happening in this part of the country. Did you all actually have more and more be cast a spotlight on the underside of the American Empire? And because there's so much sleepwalking in the country, People wake up at different times. You know. <laughs> Henry David Thoreau realized that in Walden Pond, that epigraph, what can I do to awake my fellow citizens from their sleepwalking? Well, Brother Henry, it takes a while sometimes. <laughs> That's all right. We continue to try to speak the truth, try to expose lies, try to bear witness, not in the spirit of self-righteousness. Because all of us have had moments when we were sleepwalking too. You don't come out of the womb with revolutionary fire. <laughs> like Malcolm X. <laughs> after Elijah loved him. And then after he began to outlove Elijah. And now that love is still over from the chocolate side to the vanilla side to the other side to the cow. Oh yes. Dorothy Day, love warrior to the core. <laughs> to the core. Never forget this, Sister Dorothy. Now I know I'm in Syracuse. The barrack is oh my God, Brother Daniel, Brother Steele, and the others. <laughs> Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, we shall never forget your witness, the truth telling you, pointing out the lies and the crimes of your own government, even as you never forgot the vicious treatment of your own precious Jewish brothers and sisters by a Jew hating thug named Hitler and Nazis. Edward Zaid, such a love brother, he was my dear brother. Oh, yes, my dear Palestinian brother, telling the truth, exposing the lies, trying to ensure and cast the spotlight on those whose humanity rendered invisible. I want to begin with an epigraph, though, from the great W.B. Du Bois. I want you to picture in your mind, 89 years old, just in the out of a courtroom, I had him in handcuffs. As part of the Peace Information Center trying to bid the world of nuclear bombs. That's 17,300 now. It's cast as an enemy of the U.S. government. The same Du Bois, founder in the late CP, first PhD in Harvard, by the dissertation on the suppression of the African slave trade. The same Du Bois that went on to write Souls of Black Folk in 1903. The same Du Bois that left the country three years before he died and did join the Communist Party and said, Cheer up, black folk. You'll never win in America. You better cast it on a global and international stage if you want to preserve your sanity. That's what the boys I'm talking about. He decided to embark on a trilogy, three novels at 89 years old. That's what kind of revolutionary fire he did. In that first novel called The Lord's Deal of Man's Art, he turned to page 275. And he says, I've been wrestling with four questions all of my life. And I've yet to provide adequate responses, not just propositional answers, but responses in terms of a life lived. An embodiment and an enactment of vision. The first question, how does integrity face oppression? How does integrity face oppression? The second was, 
What does honesty do in the face of deception? What does honesty do in the face of deception? Third question. What does decency do in the face of insult? Decency do in the face of insult. And that last query, the boy says, how does virtue meet brute force? And those are the four pillars, it seems to me, that bring us together. Because if all of us are concerned with what does it mean to be human? What kind of human being will we choose to be in our brief move from our mama's womb to tomb? No accident our English word human comes from the Latin humano, which means burying and burial, because yes, it's true, we are fellow of two legged linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces, whose body will one day be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. That's who we are. We're not here that long. And the question is, what kind of person will you be? Well, it has something to do with integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue, so that when they talk about you at your funeral, they'll have something to say beyond just how many material possessions you had, how many commodities you accumulated, and how many folk you dominate. Oh, yes, that's what Tuck of Missionary Baptist Church is all about. That's the tradition that produced this crack vessel. I come out of Shiloh Baptist, they call it Tuck of Missionary. Yes. Same end and same aim. I want to be a certain kind of human being in which, in the face of brute force, in the face of care, in the face of trauma, in the face of stigma, somehow I was able to raise to a higher moral and spiritual ground that allowed me to connect myself with those who came before and tried to teach me, lo and behold, you can be a better human being no matter what your circumstances and conditions are. Oh yeah, that's the tradition I'm talking about. That's the tradition I'm talking about. I'm talking about the tradition of Emma Teal's mother when she stepped through the lectern and her baby is in the coffin. Yes. Only child killed by cowardly American terrorists, cowardly American white supremacists in Dutch bucket, Jim Crow, Mississippi, Emma Teal. What you got to say, Miss Teal, to the world? Speak on behalf of not just black people, not just America. Speak on behalf of the best of the human spirit. We hear your pain. We see the tears in your eyes. It kept the casket open, didn't it? So that 50,000 people marched through Robert, Robert Temple Church of God in Christ on the west side of Chicago in August of 1955. She said, we're going to keep that casket open. We want the world to see the night side of the American Empire. Oh, yeah. The way she said it, she stepped in that neck and they had cameras from all around the world and with tears in her eyes and with Socratic energy flowing, keeping track of the dawn of white supremacy, she said, what? I don't have a minute to hate. I will pursue justice for the rest of my life. Yeah. What goes into that kind of witness? What goes into that kind of vision? You don't do it by yourself. You gotta come out of a tradition. You gotta come out of a community. You have to have remembrance. You have to have reverence for something bigger than your ego. And you have to have resistance. You have to be willing to straighten your back up. Brother Martin used to say what? Anytime, every day, people straighten their backs up there, going somewhere, because folk can't ride your back unless it's big. Laughing when it ain't funny. Okay. Scratching when it don't itch. <laughs> Just scared and intimidated and afraid. Yes. Brother Priest today on what? Don't be afraid. Marcus Garvey I used to have a black man leading every rally. The Negro is not afraid. <laughs> because once in fact you conquer fear, then you're really willing to tell the truth and bear witness and be willing to pay a cost. And there is an intimate relation between the preciousness of Emmett Teal and the preciousness of the children in Afghanistan. 
the anthem of black people, lifted every voice, but refused to be an echo. In America, we specialize in producing copies rather than originals. And the reason why is because the intimate connection, the connecting of the dots between the Wall Street complex, the financialization of our capitalist society of 42% of the profits go to big banks, they don't produce products, they produce deals, billions of dollars remain in private hands, $2.2 trillion offshore, don't have to pay taxes whatsoever, no accountability whatsoever. And when they engage in intense forms of criminality, inside of trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activity, how many Wall Street executives have gone to jail since 2008 because of the catastrophe? Zero, still nothing whatsoever. But let the ball be caught with a threat bag right on the corner when he first the jail. Let the teacher be caught. Still a straight to jail. Been teaching in jail for 37 years. I was just brought it back with my class in Broadway. 150 brilliant brothers. 62% of them in there for salt drugs. Seven years, 15 years, 25 years, but you got these criminals running around sipping tea in Washington coming out of Wall Street. The old brother West, he's kind of like, you anti-rich. No, I'm not anti-rich. I'm anti-injustice. Oh, yeah. Oh, you kind of like, you anti-America. I'm not anti-America. I'm anti-injustice. Oh, yeah. But I'll tell you what, I'm a pro. Don't wave your flag in front of me if you go subjugate people and kill innocent children and treat workers like they're marginal utilities and demean women and somehow lose sight of the humanity of gay brothers and lesbian sisters. If that flag doesn't conform to my understanding of the cross, and for me the cross is about unarmed truth and the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to and if they're not allowing suffering to speak, they're not telling the truth. And I believe in unconditional love. I know a lot of my left partners don't always agree with me on that. That's all right. You got a right to be wrong. <laughs> we work it together, but I believe in unconditional love. And see, for me, the kingdom of God ain't no brand. And the cause of freedom ain't no commercial. And the struggle for for black dignity is not an advertisement. It's a way of life. And they are connected. Vicious layers of the white supremacy, male supremacy, anti-Jewish hatred, anti-Arab hatred, anti-Muslim hatred, homophobia, tied to a capitalist system that is a failed system when it comes to poor people and working people. A failed system It has yet to meet that criteria responding to the needs of the poor and working slices of our fragile experiment in democracy. But it's also tied to imperial crime. It's also tied to the refusal of the United States to understand the degree to which we're not only a fragile experiment in democracy, we are an imperial endeavor. It always upsets me when I see these journalists and scholars talking about the enslavement of black people being America's original sin. That's not true. White supremacy was the original sin, but the original sin was the vicious treatment of our indigenous brothers. That was the first. Let's get it right. What they underwent, the dispossession of their land, the violation of their children and men and women. And it's not a matter of PC chit chat, it's a matter of trying to tell the truth about how America became America. And then comes that crime against humanity with the enslavement of black people. That's number two. That's number two. But the challenge becomes what? The challenge is how do we tell the truth in such a way? 
that we can still remain agents that we don't feel debilitated, we don't feel paralyzed. When you look up at what you're up against, you say, oh my God. <laughs> got the army, got the navy, and they got nuclear bombs, and they got FBI, CIA. We probably got some FBI here. Glad to have you here. Glad to have you here. Yeah, we probably do. That's right. We're going to tell the truth. Hey, welcome, welcome. Who's right in here? Come on in. Listen. Lord, I'm sorry. Yeah. But at the same time, when you think of the history of those engaged in their fallible quest for integrity in the face of cupidity and finality, who fundamentally wanted to be honest in the face of deception, who looked at the corporate media with its massive weapons of distraction, <laughs> refusing to attend to crucial things but attending to the bottom line, Money, 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 profits, profit, profits. And you got Fox News, mean spirited, cold hearted Republican propaganda. You got MSBC, milk coast, spineless, neoliberal, democratic party, propaganda. None of them want to talk about drones. None of them want to talk about innocent civilians. None of them want to talk about the precious children that have been killed in our name. Now I want to talk about poverty. Now I want to talk about Wall Street. Now it's just this little deodorized, sterilized, sanitized, truncated discourse that goes as political dialogue in a market-driven society. No, we refuse that kind of parochialism. We refuse that kind of provincialism. Thank God for Sister Amy Goodman had the other. Oh yeah, thank God for that. Public educational system trying to demonize the teachers. We know that rich kids get taught and poor kids get tested. We don't like it. We don't like it. Why? The poor kids are just as precious as rich kids. We gotta miss everybody's kids, but we were not born. We may have been born that night, but not last night. <laughs> the consensus that high then conceals the Catastrophe is taking place every day. Look at the treatment of the trade union movement as if somehow there's some powerful special interest that's not concerned with public interest, but the business roundtable somehow was viewed up having the same status as the trade union movement. When did that become normal? I know you all in Syracuse with rich history you have. There used to be a labor page in the newspaper. Now it's just a business page. <laughs> That's the tip for a chapter. People talk about this book now, Brother Thomas' book, the Kennedy's book. Capital in the 21st century. Lo no and behold, the reports of capital are beyond that of economic growth, and therefore wages are stagnating and declining, and therefore wealth inequality is constituting a challenge to our democratic. And then the mainstream start great bands like MC Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? People have been saying that for decades. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> But we have to be able to make the connection between the Wall Street complexes, the corporate multiplexes, the imperial crimes, which drones, of course, a major manifestation. And then, of course, there is the prison industrial complex. Slavery by another man. And see, when it comes to the prison industrial complex, it's intimately connected with the wars and the military budget. Why? Because even in the midst of budgetary constraints, we can always find money for wars and for prison. Wars and for prison. Oh, when it comes to quality education, can't find a penny. When it comes to jobs with a living wage, can't find a penny. When it comes to decent housing, oh, things are so tight. When it comes to health, 
health care, things are so tight. And even with Brother Obama, we appreciate the extension in terms of health care, but we know there's a bonanza for the pharmaceutical companies. There's a bonanza for the insurance company which has brought their market and has a mandate for them to have to pay. Okay, we allow for the celebration of the extension, but we want justice. We just don't want extension of lack of relative injustice. Oh, but Brother West, it's better. Okay, okay, it is better. But Brother Mom, we used to say, what, you got to that nine inches, you pull it out six inches, it won't be the celebration of progress. <laughs> pull it out, pull it out. <laughs> but the prison industrial complex is real. There's been a Marshall Plan in the last 30 years in this country. But the Marshall Plan has not gone into infrastructure, education, housing, and health care. It's gone into prison. $500 billion. When I first started teaching in the pr prisons in Norfolk, about 1974, about 300,000 folks in prison, there was 2.4 million. 2.4 million. Disproportionately poor and very much a chocolate affair. It was more like the National Basketball. Ball Association and the National Hockey League. <laughs> and yet we know 12% of young black brothers and sisters flying out in the friendly sky every week, 12%. Vanilla side of town, 12%. 65% of convictions black. That means you got a criminal justice system which in some ways is itself criminal. <laughs> is itself criminal. Generation after generation after generation Sending these precious brothers back and down in poor white to a prison industrial complex, and yet they're in taking it the same rate as white. And I don't want the jail just to be more colorful. I don't want more white brothers just to get to go to jail so we have parity. I'm just talking about hypocrisy and mendacity and the gap between what people are saying and what is being done. And that's part and parcel of the history. That's part and parcel of the history. Because everybody knows when it comes down to it, the lo and behold, the black folk straighten that back up and become away. The peace movement takes on new life. The trade union movement takes on new life. The feminist movement with the womanist injection takes on new life. The anti homophobic movement takes on new life. We're not going to worry about people saying, oh, Lord, Brother West, you're spending time around those peace, peace activists. I said, you're going to spend time around black folk. I said, yeah, black folk in the peace movement. What you doing? Know? <laughs> but the perception is it's primarily vanilla. And of course, it is a reflection of the fact that we haven't picked up on the legacy of Rabbi Abraham Jesha Thompson Hesham, Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Day, the Barrigans, they connected the dots. They connected the dots. And once you connect the dots, you constitute a threat to the powers that be. I don't care what color those in office are. Oh, yeah. And the lion says, hey, look at Brother Martin Luther King Jr. We know that when he died, 72% of Americans disapproved of him, 55% of black people disapproved of Brother Martin. How come? Trying to bring all four people together, all colors. Critique, capital system. He had memories being in that paddy wire on the way to Reedville prison and put him in the dark with a German shepherd threatening him for five hours. Didn't tell him where they taking him and when they finally reached the prison in that tall county in Georgia, the only folk there was Andy Young and his father. Brother Andy Young told me, he said, Brother, when we saw Martin, we were convinced he had a nervous breakdown. He could not walk straight at all. He had tears in his eyes. And the only thing he could say was, this is the cross we must bear for the freedom of our people. That's the kind of brother we talk about. He's not a god, he's not a deity, he's a broke. He's a crap vessel like anybody else. He just had enough courage and he had enough vision and he had enough memory, he had enough integrity, honesty, and decency to try to connect the dots. That's where we 
Connecting the dots. It's not going to be just a matter now of colorful faces in high places. I did celebrate when Brother Barack Obama won only because the two he was running against were dangerous. <laughs> but it turns out he was dangerous. <laughs> How could anybody who wants to be morally consistent talk about the war crimes of George Bush and not also talk about the war crimes of Barack Obama? Yeah. Yeah, be consistent. Oh, Brother West, he's a black man. He's a brother. He's a brother. He's a brother. I'm a man. He's a brother. I'm fighting against white supremacy, too. Let the white supremacists attack him. I start swinging like Muhammad Ali in elephant. The right way is dangerous. They mistreat my brother. They disrespected my brother. They demonized my brother. They think he's a Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> they think he's a socialist. Please. <laughs> right way. But that is not an excuse for us not to tell the truth, expose lies, and bear witnesses when in fact his policies are tilted toward Wall Street, they're tilted toward authoritarian sensibilities with a national security state and national surveillance keeping track of every citizen already documented for Americans, citizens with no accountability whatsoever. We just want to tell the truth. We just want to bear witness to justice. It's something bigger than your color, it's bigger than your gender, it's bigger than your class, it's bigger than your nation. Think about what kind of human
We're going to have about 15 or 20 minutes of questions and answers for him. And so we can hear as much as possible. We ask that when you ask a question, keep it short. And please don't make a statement. <laughs> There's plenty of opportunities to make statements at other times. We'll have microphones. You can stay where you are. And the ushers will have them. Are they coming up? I need some ushers to get some microphones. And there'll be a microphone over here and over here, and they'll pass it to you. So again, as much as we want to stay here forever, we do have places to go after this, too. And Dr. West will be joining us at the rally and walk.
And so the question becomes, how then do we talk honestly about the fundamental need for security so the Jews themselves do not undergo any kind of vicious attack or assault alongside the dignity and justice for Palestinians because the occupation is not going to be a means by which that Jewish security can be procured. And so we need to have a serious, robust public conversation about that. And we can see on the notion, again, very basic, that a Palestinian baby has the same value as a Jewish baby, the Jewish baby has the same value as a Palestinian baby, and they are precious, precious, old souls. So the atmosphere has to be one in which people feel as if they can enter in with people having a sense of what is at stake. Because dignity and justice for Palestinians are negotiable. Security for Jewish brothers and sisters anywhere, not just in Israel, anywhere, it's unnegotiable. Why? Because that's what it is to be morally consistent. That's what it is to take a higher spiritual breath. My brother. Um, you connected the dots uh, by inequality. You see inequality here in a domestic plane and um, in an international situation. I was hoping you could connect the dots between war and the degradation of our environment. That's a wonderful question, my brother. Very, very, very You're absolutely right. I didn't even say I didn't say anything about the domination of nature, anything about the ecological catastrophe that's right around the corner. And it looks like we just act as if put our heads in the sand, as it were. I mean, I did try to make a connection between the terrorists, because when I talked about black people, being the terrorist, that's the internal terrorism. We're talking about indigenous people, that's terrorism. That's just not inequality. See, that's just not inequality. Inequality is real. But terror is something else. That's tied to trauma. That's psychic, as well as political and economic. But you are absolutely right. I didn't say I mumbled a word about it. The impending ecological catastrophe. And I need to say much more, and that must always be a crucial part, an integral part of our concerns of connecting the dots. So thank you so very much for that. Hi, I'm Margaret Well, you know, my, you know I'm from Harlem. My name is Reverend Olivia Armstrong. And this is going to take a minute because it was inspired by Reverend Dr. James Washington. I am a poet, a poetess since 1988. And it's called Drones. Well, I know drones kill while they fly over the hills. I know that drones will knock out your cell phones and leave your family alone. Drones are a complicated beast. It hides in the mystery. Who's up for a feast? Drones are U.S. dichotomy. They save lives and help the economy. Hmm. Drones supposed to keep U.S. safe. Someone alive left us in disgrace. Hmm. Really? Or is it another symptom about the eugenic science and genocide of a race? Hmm. Drones try to keep people blind. We ask God to keep our mind. Today we must stop killing the symptoms. They keep coming back and keeping us on track. We have we have to now take it by its roots and walk in our ancestors' boots. And there is no more time to keep being spooked. And, and the young brothers love me. Thank you. Wow. And thank you very well for Washington. I mean, my best friend I've ever had in the world. That's what I hope. You all know James Washington. The book you put together, a collection of writings, Martin Luther King Jr. It's the one text known all around the world. And he passed tonight. I was just at his grave just, just, just a few weeks ago. He passed in 1997. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I have a question. Um, how can we understand the popularization of drone technology? So in Coachella, they had drones um, taking pictures and video. We had um, recently, there was an article about drone technology being used secretly over Compton in Los Angeles. And then you also have Amazon coming out with their drone technology to like deliver your packages. 
Yeah, yeah. so can you speak on that? Thank you. Yeah, I think part of it has to do is that we live in an age of hyper-capitalism where the attempt to deliver some particular aim usually tied to killing or making money is an obsession. Yeah. And so it's push buttons, sensibility. You want it now, you want it overnight. Uh, you don't want it, you don't want to send the soldiers, so you just have your joysticks in Arizona or Hancock or whatever it is. You know, it's, 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 it's this obsession with short-term gain, shorter-term gain, quick gain. And people say, well, there's got a lot of positive effects. It might help someone. It may help you. The doctor's find the sick. It may help somebody lost in the, in the Yosemite Park. Well, that's true. Technology always has two sides to it. It's always Janet's face in that regard, no doubt. But we're just trying to connect it to structures of domination, we're trying to connect it to forms of exploitation. Uh, and, that, and that's, I think, what has been magnificent about the Peace Council. And we should give it up to Sister Medea Benjamin and Cole Pink. <laughs> Thank you again for connecting the dots between poverty and education and between the babies in Afghanistan and the babies in Syracuse. Because Onondaga Citizens League just came out with a report saying that our kids are not ready for kindergarten. And they want Dolly Parton to send every kid in Onondaga County a book. Now that might be okay, but this is something that's been going on for 40 years. And we want to make sure that something is going to change the structural you know, disparities in this county such that we won't have 40, 50 percent of our kids under five living in poverty. So what do we need to do as a community besides sending them books? And what do we need to do to make sure that all kids are ready for not only kindergarten, but even Head Start and Pre-K? Thank you, Adam. I appreciate the heartfelt quality of that question, too, though, I mean, I think in one sense, you recall Brother Martin went down trying to eradicate poverty in the way in which Frederick Douglass was trying to eradicate slavery, the way Lloyd Garrison was trying to eradicate slavery, I'd be well trying to eradicate lynching. We need an abolitionist movement around poverty. We need a serious abolitionist movement around poverty. Now, that might be further down the road. It means that we have to come together from different communities. I mean, I think one of the worst things that has happened in our highly uh, atomized, individualized uh, society is that we think that we only should talk about an issue if it directly affects us, as opposed to being concerned about what's going on in other neighborhoods, other parts of the city, and coming together, because this issue of education means all of our destinies are tied together. But it's just a matter of the interest group, the interest group. This is the worst thing that's happened to the Black Freedom Movement. When people think of the Black Freedom Movement, first thing they think of is what? The black community and black interests. No, 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 no. Black folks have never, we've never been a people only concerned about our interests. We have our interests, but we have integrity, honesty, decency, principles. We've always been concerned about all of those interests. But the same is true. The Freedom Movement not just, just concerned about workers, they're concerned about the quality of the society and workers are an integral part of that, which means they also were concerned about the immigration issue, sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, and so forth. So we have to get out of these boxes, just interest group, interest group, interest group. That's the first thing. So the suburbs, the techno birds, they come together with their birds. <laughs> And say, this is our issue together. We're concerned about these precious children, no matter what neighborhood or what That's the first thing. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Cornell, oh, excuse me. Cornell, 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 Cornell,
result in the same thing. We are killing an uh, enemy people we hate. The, the, the killing, they always have a killing instrument. And I don't see any difference. So I think that we can, that we're doing the same things that the German people did in the 30s with our. I don't like to engage in this algebra of blood where you compare all of these different things. All of them are so vicious, all of them are so ugly. They have different scopes and different breaths and so forth. But once we see how immoral they are and how unjust they are, that ought to be sufficient motiv motivation to want to ensure that it doesn't happen again. Be it drone or concentration camp or an internment camp for Japanese. And in the 1990s, 1940s, and so forth, uh, uh, very much so. I think that the uh, but what what is important in, 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 in when it comes to the drone for us today is the level of secrecy yeah. right. and lack of transparency and sheer mendacity. They just lie about it when they get caught, Brennan and the other, and that's our government that we have direct access to. And that's something that does, I, I think, define it in a very different way than some of the other very ugly and indescribable forms of evil, like what happened to Jewish brothers and sisters under, uh, under Hitler and the Nazi. Well, what happened in you know, the, 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 the Congo under the Belgium, five and a half, six million people officially killed and so forth, go on and on, whole pot. We go on on Stalin and Mao. I mean, we, human beings, we've got a record. <laughs> Oh, we got a vicious and ugly record, I'm telling you. We got, I think, two more questions. I don't know what, what you brother got the microphone on. I know drugs are bad, but I don't understand why some people think they're good. Do you know why? Oh, what a question my name I did. Yes, please. I would want to ask the people who say drones are good, I want to hear what their argument is. I don't think they have an argument that is in any way persuasive by this sister. I think that they're following either lies that are put forward by the mainstream or they're accenting certain uses of drones that they are projecting in the future. The drones we're talking about here tonight, I don't think anybody could ever claim that forms of bombing that result in the loss of lives of innocent people, including precious young folk like yours, is good. That's never, ever, ever, ever good. That's not good. So we do need to announce exactly who it was and so forth and so on. No doubt about that. 
but is not in any way some kind of uh, uh, aberration in the history of this country in relation to terrorism. It's just that we had to experience it as if it was something new. I mean, I've called it in the past a kind of niggerization of the country. It was the first time all Americans felt unsafe, unprotected, subject to random violence, and hated for who they are. Uh, yeah, to be black in America. Unsafe, unprotected, subject to random violence, and hated for who you are. Well, for a lot of black folk, it wasn't about 9 11. It's a very sad situation, but uh, I've been 9 11 fired for a long time. <laughs> I've had to over and over and over again. The question is, what is our response? Is, is it the response of Emma Till's mother to American terrorism? Or is it the response of George Bush? Hunt them down like cockroaches and consume. Or Obama. Increase the terror in other parts and slowly pull back on the ugly invasion and occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan with U.S. mercenaries still in place and with U.S. government still willing to provide them resources. What does it respond to 9-11, the event, in light of the four structural realities that I was alluding to? That's the beginning of an answer to your question, though, brother. You know, we need much more time. Much more time.